Welcome to Comer Report Live. I'm Bob Coleman. We're talking Main Street and the small business lenders who help it grow. Chris Hearn, CEO, co-founder, Fountainhead Commercial Capital out of Orlando, uh, PPP lender extraordinaire. Um, changes affecting you from President Biden, Chris? What do you think about that? I think it's good. I think it's great that the administration and the SBA are going to target these micro businesses. Um, I was actually telling Lance before we jumped on, we uh, we had been anticipating this for a little bit. We actually had created a new, what we call our PPP fast lane, which is specifically for self-employed, which actually automates the process. So we're we're expecting that this is going to be uh, very, very helpful to a lot of these folks who have otherwise been. How's that going to affect the applicants or the borrowers who are in limbo, who are uh, more than 20 employees? Is that uh, a problem or? Well, it's a problem, but I think they're just going to have to sort of wait on the sidelines. Uh, we were encouraging them to go ahead and, and submit to us, um, and we just can't, it's, you know, we can process their, their request. We just can't submit to SBA during this two-week period of time. So um, it's a it's a little frustrating, I suppose, for them, but you know, this is this is what SBA does sometimes is they you know, can start and stop things and hopefully let's target ask, funds. Yeah. Let's ask everyone else, how much inconvenience are the new regs? Chris said they're a little frustrating. We don't have that as an option. <laughs> <laughs> I would say a little impact. I think that's how Chris answered it. Yeah, yeah, I think little impact. Although I will tell you, Bob, if it's a little strange, go. so it's going to start tomorrow, the two weeks, but then all oh, the other. Chris, you're not reading my script. You just gave away tomorrow's answer or the next poll question oh, answer. Well, I'm sure, they, <laughs> I'm sure they didn't listen that carefully. Chris, uh, the, point Chris. Is, the point is, if it starts, if it starts soon, um, they should all <laughs> they should all start. The fact that they might roll out some of these other things, like the new calculation for for uh, sole props and independent contractors, the following week, to me, is just bizarre. I don't know why SBA can't just roll it all out at once um, to really have the impact. Otherwise, you're, you're actually going to not have the full impact of this two-week period. You're only going to have maybe, you know, four or five days or something, depending on when you get well, out. It's a little bit strange. I agree with Chris 100%. You know, the new sole prop uh, Schedule C rules would allow for larger PPP loans for those individuals. Of course, obviously, there are less than 20 employees. So Chris is absolutely on point. It takes away the full impact by not having them both roll out at the same time. That's right. And it's not like it's complicated. It's pretty yeah. easy. Are Everybody we waiting knows. for anything else, uh, number one? And number two, when are those rules going to be implemented? Any idea? They're telegraphing sometime next week, which, like, that's why I'm a little baffled by this because, you know, all the lenders who can change their technology to make you know, to change the calculations literally in seconds. Uh, why is SBA not being able to do this? It's just bizarre. To me. Let's see what the answers are here. Uh, I'll try not to give anything away. Ninety. I, 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 there should be a ninety percent uh, correct answer on this. There we go. Ninety-one percent. That good with you, Katie? Yeah, sounds like most people are paying attention. Uh, I think we probably confused them toward the end with that 5% from March 1st. I think they're probably thinking about the other aspects of it, uh, which are supposed to come sometime early March. And this question, we want to be very specific, exactly how many employers are we talking about? And I have a follow-up question, which for Katie on this is, what about contractors, Katie? Are contractors included in that number? So what they're um, what they're doing is they're saying basically you're going to have to count every single person regardless of the uh, type of employee that is. Um, so it's going to be uh, this this answer to this one is actually uh, false. It's it's 19 employees or less. It's not including the 20, which I think a lot of people are going to get caught up on because. Even when I read it at first, I thought they were saying 20, but uh, yesterday's conference, they did clarify that it's 19 or less. What I'd like on that poll question, can you put it back up, Joseph, is 0% said, I don't know, which I love. Mm -hmm. Look at that. <laughs> they were confident. <laughs> and then finally, um, we can skip the next question poll. Um, 
Joseph. It's, it's on the contractors. Chris, what's your understanding of contractors? Uh, SBA wants independent contractors to get their own PPP loan. Always has. Oh, it, it, I guess what I'm saying is if you have a contractor, is that included against your employee account? Uh, I don't think so because we're not allowed to count it as part of the wages either. So, yeah. Lance, is that your understanding? That's my, <clears throat> that's my understanding as well. Uh, but one thing Chris and I were talking about before we started, uh, there's a whole plethora of contractors that could apply for PPP loans that have not, like Chris and I were, Chris was talking about Uber drivers, Uber you know, Uber drivers DoorDash drivers. I mean, you can go down the list. There are a ton of contractors who, in fact, can apply for PPP. Uh, who probably haven't up to this point, and maybe this is an opportunity for them to jump on board. Katie, well, yeah, I, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just no. going to say I've I've been my myself and some of my partners have been presenting to SBA for a few weeks now about some of these things. This disparity that I think you see this announcement that came out yesterday is an attempt to address this. I mean, there are over forty-one million Americans in this country who are non-employee um, business owners, uh, who, who, excuse me, are non-employer businesses for PPP, 41 million. And these, these are, these, this is the part-time real estate agent. This is the part-time consultant. This is the hairdresser, the Uber driver, the, uh, you know, the shipped guy. I mean, just, there's so many of these folks who have a side hustle or a side gig. Uh, or this is what they do full time. And frankly, you know, last year's PPP didn't address them much. This year so far, it hasn't addressed them much. So I think that's what you're seeing now is the result of this administration saying, you know what, we want to we want to push down to the micro businesses. We want to try to take care of absolutely. Something. Yeah, and I I, I agree 100 percent. These people are ineligible for unemployment benefits. Yeah, right. Katie, give us the numbers. Uh, what specifically are we talking about when you say 9 a.m. tomorrow, Eastern time, uh, Eastern, Pacific yeah. time? Uh, yeah, Red yeah. So time. starting 9 a.m. tomorrow morning, Eastern, uh, the SBA portal will only be accepting loans from businesses that have 19 or less uh, employees. So remember, that's fewer than 20 if you're getting confused. Uh, the applications already submitted uh, today and earlier that are kind of in limbo right now because we're uh, handling hold codes and things like that, those will still be processed. It's just after tomorrow you won't be able to submit any of those and you'll get a notice saying that uh, it won't be approved. Uh, you'll have to uh, submit it again at a later time. Uh, yeah, and when counting this last point, each employee counts as one regardless of full-time, part-time, or seasonal. It's interesting. Yeah, Chris, tell me more. Go ahead, yeah, Katie. so this, uh, just to add, the, the platform has already been updated so that it will automatically tell you if the uh, employee count is greater than 19. It'll let you know that uh, they can't access the program right now. Uh, but if you are having problems with that, there is the technical uh, assistance uh, contact information at the very bottom there if you need to, uh, if you have issues with that. Lance, so we're revising the formula for Schedule C. What is the formula, Lance? Do you know? Well, we're revising the line that they use uh, historically or previously. We'd use that bottom line number on the Schedule C. and Which is? What's, what's that? Net profit? But, Line 31, yeah. Yeah, and now we're using more of a gross income number, line 7, I think right. it is. Is that right, Chris? Yep, that's correct. Uh, which, for, for Schedule C filers, that's going to increase the size of their PPP loans. And quite frankly, it's, it's a fairer way to calculate their PPP loan because they may have expensed their <laughs> – they, if they had substantial expenses, their net profit might have been negligible, but they still needed PPP support. So uh, this will help those Schedule C filers get a little bit more substantial PPP loan and have more of an impact. What is the, what is the formula, Chris? What, um, what are we so, talking about? Yeah, well, C? Well, well, just just to follow on with what Lance is saying, I mean, I think this is a way to bring, and my argument with SBA is, has been for many months, is you've got self-employed farmers, Schedule Fs, 
that you're allowing them to use gross income to calculate their PPP loan. Now you're bringing sole props and independent contractors also in alignment with them, allowing them to use line seven, their gross income as well. So you're just taking, you're taking that line, um, whatever that amount is, and you're dividing it by 12 to get your average monthly payroll cost, and then taking that times two and a half. If it's okay, a, so the farm is still the same. Yeah. No. yeah. And if you have, if I'm a restaurant owner and schedule C, do I get the three and a half times multiple? You do for a second draw loans, yes. Yep. And we still need to have the reduction in sales, is that correct? For second draw. For still, second draw. Yeah. Yeah. Sales. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Katie, and what are we talking about this last bullet point? Additionally, $1 billion will be set aside. I just... Yeah, so this is about. just... Yeah, that's just an extra set aside. It's not them adding money or taking away money. It's just guaranteeing that at least $1 billion will be set aside for Schedule C applicants uh, with no employees that are located in low and moderate income areas. And they were saying to check that, you're going to use um, the HUD to see if you, if you need to use to find out if they're in the low and moderate income areas. Can you be more specific on that, on how do we check that? Um, is there a website? They didn't give any more Why details. They just said use HUD. Mm -hmm. Is it county? Is it zip code, guys? Uh, it can. It, it's different, Bob. You can take a particular zip code, and there'll be LMI areas uh, in a portion of a zip code. So uh, it... it uh, <clears throat> It, it certainly, you can go to HUD and check it if you are working with a lending institution. Most of them have a pretty easy way to check it for you, uh, but you can use HUD's website or ask your banker. Does the, does the website, is this the website that allows you to put in a specific street address and it'll pop up whether it's eligible or not? I'm not sure about that, Bob, because I'm lazy. I have a department <laughs> bank that I can say, here's the address. Is it a LMI? So, uh, well, we'll research that. We'll, uh, we'll, uh, well, and, and, I, and again, I think this comes from what the feedback I heard over the last few weeks in dealing with SBA was there was really three buckets of borrowers that they were most concerned with, which is the folks that didn't get PPP before, okay, that qualified, and that for whatever reason they didn't get it. The people that had fewer than 10 employees, that's what they told us, but maybe they've increased it to fewer than 19. And then this LMI folks. And of course, this one is one, as, as we just noticed, none of us necessarily focus on this. This is more of an issue probably in, in residential lending, like with, with HUD, right. for instance. Um, but this is of, of a concern to, to the current folks at SBA, it's these three buckets. And I think what you're seeing now, this announcement that came out early yesterday morning and, and yesterday afternoon, this is their attempt to try to address these disparities. So that's, that's right. really down to. I was, I was trying to find my notes where I was... That's, right. well, that's your homework. So tomorrow, uh, tell us on how we can access it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Most of the people, most of the people on this call, Bob, that uh, are working at financial institutions have a great familiarity with LMI because uh, our examiners want a certain amount of lending activity in those LMIs. I understand that, but I also understand there's different charts by different agencies. Yeah. USDA is a different one, and that's why I want to make sure we have the right chart. And we're all on the same page in terms of what we're doing. Uh, Katie, tell us about felons and student loan debt delinquencies. Are these proposals or are these now policy? Yeah, these are actually going to be our policy in March. They don't have an exact start date, but uh, probably that first week of March. Uh, they're eliminating the restrictions on business owners who have non-fraud convictions. However, they did note that they are still going to have restrictions in place for borrowers with an arrest or conviction for felony fraud in the past five years and for those who are currently incarcerated. Lance, what do we do? Do we fill out a 912? How do we, uh, who signs off on this? Does this SBA? Is this the lender? How do we logistically? Well, uh, I think the, the participant bank and Chris helped me with this. I think you're going to have to rely on the borrower certification on this. Um, because I've, I've not seen any guidance to do a 912. Right. Um, it's for most SBA participant lenders that have been around for a while, this is a little bit uncomfortable because we've not ever done this before. That's uh, right. 
A yeah. little bit uncomfortable is an understatement, Lance. <laughs> it, uh, well, it's just like the next thing we're going to talk about, doing a deal for somebody who defaulted on a student loan. I mean, it's printed somewhere inside here that says student loan default. I can't help you. I'm sorry. Nonprofits bad, student loan bad, spelling bad. All right, now we're... we're now, one thing I think that what's going to happen, Lance, is is people are just going to, you know, unless we get guidance, like you said, to, to fill out a nine twelve or something else, I think it's just going to be one of these things that you you go with the borrower certifications, you submit to SBA, and then surprise, surprise, their validations kick it out and air it out, and then you find out that you have to go back to them and and dis discuss these things. Well, and I'm surprised that there were not a little more description about the type of uh, felony convictions that uh, would be prohibited from getting this. I understand some of them. You know, somebody that gets a, a felony DWI five years ago, well, that probably shouldn't be excluded from the program, but there are some types of criminal activity that may or may not need to be in this group uh, that, uh, so, I mean, again, it's pretty uncomfortable. I think most of you are going to have to rely on the borrower. Well, you're going to have to rely on the borrower certification unless we hear otherwise from SBA. Yeah. And I, I know they talked about, uh, uh, child related felonies. I assume those are excluded. Yeah. Um, and you know, it's sort of a common sense type situation. I think the standard is back at the, again, the lender can choose to do this or not to do it. Correct, Lance? Uh, I'm going to say, Bob, you probably am, are going to have to go. I, I don't want lenders to end up involved in another PPP related lawsuit. So I think you probably want to follow <laughs> what SBA is recommending. My question on this slide, Katie, is delinquency is okay. We're now eligible. What about charge offs? They haven't really discussed it too much in depth yet. I believe what they're planning on doing is later this week issuing a lot more guidance on these. We've really only received a little bit of information on it. Um, they haven't really addressed charge offs yet. It will, it will be one of those things I hope is in the uh, guidance that they're sending out later this week. And Bob, I'm not sure how much student debt actually gets charged off. Okay. Doesn't it, stick around, doesn't it stick around, Chris? Uh, maybe I think it sticks around forever. Yeah, I think it stays on you yeah, forever. Yeah, it's like a treasure. Yeah, I kind of thought so, but I wasn't sure. But, uh, again, this is one that, you know, I talked about it briefly yesterday, defaulted and delinquent student debts, a significant SBA issue, and will continue to grow as an SBA lending issue, but on PPP? Looks like we got a free pass, guys. All right, let's talk about um, two quick things. Non-citizen business owners, um, someone, um, they're not a citizen, but they are lawful residents, and they're good to go, correct? Yes, um, so that's for green card holders, visa holders, things like that. Uh, they're just putting out some a little bit of clarification that they'll be able to use uh, their taxpayer identification number to apply a lot of them thought that they needed their social. This this kind of clarifies that, and there will be more guidance on this again later this week, uh, maybe early next week. Well, and the big question, Bob, typically in processing an SBA loan, there are circumstances where a non-citizen can get an SBA loan. They have to provide proof of their LPR status, green card, different things to document the file. The question here is, are we going to rely on a borrower certification or are we going to have to collect some information? Well, there's there's also the issue of, you may recall, last year, the first round of PPP, if you were a non-citizen, but you were the business owner and you had domestic payroll, you actually had to go and get a separate tax ID. You had, there was a separate way to go to SBA to get that tax ID number to, to allow you to get an approved PPP loan. They have not been allowing that this next, this round that we're currently in. So I think this is an attempt to maybe address some of that in addition to clarifying that, yes, in fact, if you are a legal permanent resident with a green card, you absolutely are eligible for a, for a PPP loan, just like you could get a regular SBA loan. Um, visa holders is probably a little bit more of a stretch because there's different types of visas. That's not something that historically 
has been eligible for SBA lending. So, I, but I really think that issue about the international business owner who has domestic employees, I'm hoping that this will be part of this, this clarification of these regs. Yeah, and I don't have the stats at my fingertips, but the largest pool of new entrepreneurs, new micro businesses are come from traditional um, non-citizen uh, entrepreneurs. So we are going to be revising the bar application, Katie. I don't quite understand why this is important, but uh, it's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, so it's actually, there's already a new one out right now that's uh, really the only changes they have moved that optional PPP borrower demographic to the first page in a more prominent area to try to get more people to fill that out. Uh, but they will be revising it again to reflect all these changes as soon as they issue all the rest of the guidance that's uh, going to come out with all this stuff. Very good. Uh, I only have about 25 of your questions here, <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs> what I'm going to do is we're going to put those in our new uh, product at PPP Answer Desk. And I'll select some of these to ask tomorrow. So, Katie, uh, you've got a lot of work to do, so we'll put that in. Uh, if you'd like the answers on that, shoot me an email, and we'll figure it out. And there it is on, on what we're doing on that. And Lance and Katie are going to be the primary moderator, moderators on that. I think Joseph and I will chip in when we can. Chris, good to see you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think I like the new look. <laughs> My wife. Shaven uh, your wife does. Your wife does. Well, very good. Katie, Lance, thank you very much. And thank you all for joining us for Call Report Live and for supporting America's Main Street, one entrepreneur at a time. Have a great day. Take care, Have a great everybody. day.